voices to be respected and to be heard. Just yesterday, um, I had to attend a funeral services of Darius Smith, a young man who was killed by a undercover, off-duty uh, border and customs uh, agent in the city of Arcadia. This young man was shot twice in the legs and shot three times. His friend was shot in the buttocks and in the hand. And yet the, 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 the story that's being told by the officers, this is under your investigation, this is under the Sheriff's Department's investigation. The story that's being told by the, by the Sheriff's Department is that this young man was the aggressor. Right? His friend is shot in the butt. Shot in the butt. But he's the aggressor. So I'm trying to figure out how is it that we continue to have to try to provide pastoral care and support to families and promise them some measure of, 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 of a just and a righteous and a gracious and a loving God. We don't have the capacity to even hold the people who are sworn to protect us accountable. It's heartbreaking to have to continue to try to provide support and love for these communities without any kind of teeth. Right? And we're leaving the grave site yesterday we go to a local corner store, and who walks in other than a, 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 a county sheriff? Right? And so I let my friends know a sheriff is coming into the, to the um, store. And what's the sheriff's first word? Oh, you know, his joke? Oh, we, we can't even beat somebody up. That's his joke. Yesterday, yesterday morning. Right, that's the first thing he's got to say. Oh yeah, he's, well, he wants to joke about we can't even beat somebody up. But we're in a county where y'all are killing us in our jails. And then send a vote from the jail straight to the street with hearts of stone to deal with our community. And here we are trying to cry out for some kind of something. The people who train you, the people whom you trust, the people in whose fraternal order you put your confidence to your trust, Hi. Our gang members. Hi. And they treat us like they're like the gang members. Brother, can you give us your last name again? Dolston. G H O L S T O N. I want to know what's up with 2,000 boys. What's up with 3,000 boys? What's up with gang members who are masquerading as law enforcement? <laughs> it's too much. Enough is enough. Thank you for your time. speakers, Michael Woods, Kathy Evans, and Mark Cribbs. Hmm? What's that? Oh, 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 I see. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was a little well, dead. You, 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 you were so you guys I was in the jail twice and, uh, as a civil rights leader. Let's talk about me. Is law enforcement You're so very good? Law enforcement. You're saying to yourself, we need law. We need law. Okay. And what is the law in this commission that you are predicated upon that you are enforcing? What is your teeth? What is your enforcement? So if you have the law and you have your need for enforcement, then what are you actually achieving? If you're saying that you're here for a purpose when you have no law and you have no enforcement mechanism, then you're kind of defeating your own argument for law enforcement existing to begin with. That sounds kind of weird to say, but understand you are an agency that says things must be policed. We are not the we, we do not make the laws, we just enforce them. That's what police say. So you have no law and you have no enforcement mechanism. It is absolutely pointless. And part of the reason why we have pointlessness is we're doing things like looking to the police to address mental health issues, like you said, which doesn't make any sense. So we have this policing thing that we like to say there's bad apples, or that if we fire a certain sheriff and we chop the top off, that we will achieve something. But there are no bad apples. This is a rotten barrel that has been corrupted throughout the seeds of history. Because policing, even if you say you are using the best evidence at hand, all of our data in policing is completely and absolutely corrupt because all policing goes back to one of three things, or a combination of those three things. It is 
the creation and maintenance of slave classes and extracting resources from those classes in order to support their own enforcement and oppression. The second thing is the protection of elite or essentially white property. Well, we can see those kind of incidences capsulized in the Baltimore uprising, where you have the world looking at Baltimore and saying, look at this CBS. Why are they burning down those property? And where are the police this whole time? Lined up right around the CVS, making sure that elite property doesn't get damaged, forgetting that the entire time the only person that ever died in Baltimore was Freddie Gray, and he died at the hands of state-sanctioned enforcers. And so, we created successfully to make the oppressed class, we've extracted resources from those oppressed class, and we protected white property in the entire process. The third thing that law enforcement does is it, it is the continued genocide of the Native American people, which we saw encapsulated at Standing Rock. Everything that you do as police is rooted in those three incidences and towards those goals because that's American history of policing. The first policing started in Boston to capture runaway slaves and return them to their masters in the South. And when you write a citation from that point of an 18 to 24 year old black male and you document it there, this is a crime. And then the next time you go to look at a crime and you say, well, where is the data of who commits crimes? Oh, well, it's from this person that we arrested for this offense of being a slave. And that's how everything transitions into the point where we are now. So we can not find solutions within this corrupt barrel. As long as you continue to say, well, we need to do things like have body cams. Body cams are a tool, and an incredibly dangerous tool when they are in the bucket of corrupt policing and that rotten barrel that's been seasoned throughout the time through slavery, through Jim Crow policies, through mass incarceration, through the corrupt drug war. And how do I know all this? Because I enforced it. I'm a retired detective and sergeant from Baltimore. Wow. I sat here and I enforced the drug wars and the sent, laws that sent over 450 black men to jail for crimes that were no different than anything I did growing up in white America. And as long as we continue wow. this system, as long as you sit here and you fight for how you're going to put band-aids in this corrupt system that must be rebuilt, you're doing nothing. And as long as you sit here and you think about how we are going to fix this corrupt and racist institution, then what you are doing is really putting the hood on all the fascism and the oligarchy. You're making us swallow the pill that this is okay. And it's not okay. And no answers are in here. Thank you. Wow. Oh my God. Mr. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kathy Evans and I come here to speak on behalf of an organization called Reach for Mental Health. Reach for Mental Health is a, uh, an organization that was founded, established by Dr. Rhonda Hampton. Dr. Rhonda Hampton was one of the um, folks person, family representative who is spearheading the, um, the campaign on the justice for my trees. That's, I was so happy to hear that I wasn't the only person here today to speak on behalf of my Trees Richardson, who at this point, as we all know, has no voice and at today will possibly never, will never solve her crime because of the incompetence and it was intentional, it was willful. They willfully destroyed and purposely kept out information that could have been used to solve her crime. I stand before you also to speak on behalf of the hundreds or thousands of missing women, particularly the women of color who become missing in the, in this city. Generally, um, because of this organization or because of the missing of uh, Mytrice Richardson, we began seeking out to help families who have missing children. Although we don't limit it to women of color, we open the organization for anybody who comes to us and asks us for help in locating their missing children. The truth of the matter is that once you report your child missing, um, you are on your own, and that's the truth. Mm. Um, the Sheriff's wow. Department, we don't even know what the policy is. So once you report your child missing and you come to the police, you are on your own. As we found out through working with my Teresa's case, that all of the information you have to go and do all of your own footwork, 
all of your own flyers, all whatever you need to contact or talk to the police, you have to do it yourself. The sheriff was not forthcoming with any of the information, including the day they found remains in the canyon. My Teresa's mother had to contact the press on her own to put pressure on the sheriff's department to release some information or to get the corners to even communicate with her. She, they told her that they needed to find out who the missing person was. She said, well, just show me the clothes. I know what my daughter wears. Up until her death, she was disrespected. Up until her death, she was disrespected. And then to find after they did this thorough, in, uh, this thorough investigation, they removed her remains, a forensic a, a pathologist came out and went back to the scene and found more remains. After a thorough investigation had been conducted by the Sheriff's Department, there is no excuse for that. No parent, no community, no anybody should have to suffer that. I don't know my trees. This is my trees. This is my favorite picture of my trees. I have never met this child, but based on her story, it changed my life. She changed my life because it could be me. She changed my life because my trees, when they first thought they, someone said that they saw her, it was about two miles from my church. My Teresa's family, our church community, reached out to her family, and her funeral services were held at our church, New Testament Church in Los Angeles. It makes no sense that we did not get any cooperation. Now, based on what we know of the past administration and the Sheriff's Department, this case needs to be reopened and reexamined. Amen. Based on the lies and the untruths, we know now the people that were in charge of this investigation, directly talking about Baca. That's right. He's a liar. He didn't tell the truth, even to the point where they told us they had no video of her inside of the cell. And after wow. pressure, they found the video. Mm. So we don't believe anything. And then to come back, you know, we, Kamala Harris was very nice and she helped us and reopened. And we understood she had a campaign to run. So it was kind of hard for her to give us the kind of attention and time that we needed. But it makes no sense now that this oversight committee or the sheriff's department or the new chief does not come in and at least open this case back up. It deserves a second look. Mr. Krebs, followed by Bill Stock and then Lloyd Wilkins. Good morning. My name is Art Krebs. I'm the pastor of the Los Angeles Filipino American United Church of Christ. I'm the executive director of the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity and our program Justice Not Jails. Let me first say thank you very much for coming to the board this morning, coming to our community. It is not lost on me the deficiency in numbers of representatives of our community in this room today. I think that speaks to the broken trust between the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department mm -hmm. and the people of Los Angeles County. So I just wanted to know that. Mm -hmm. I wanted to echo uh, the first speaker's concern about the lack of subpoena power. Uh, without that, uh, it reduces your credibility, your authority, and your ability to be accountable to the community. Uh, so that comes with a question. What can we, the citizens of Los Angeles County, do to help you get the power that you need to uh, subpoena uh, law enforcement authorities and others uh, who come before you? What can we do to help you get that power? Uh, secondly, how this process starts uh, is a critical indicator of the outcome. And starting a process without the authority, the credibility, and the accountability can really damage uh, the intention of this uh, of this agency if its intent is to do more than the representation of the uh, citizens of this, of this county. We think it's uh, also important not to pacify the public, but to represent the public and to hold the authority of the, of the people whose voices have not been heard as you're hearing this morning, uh, people who file complaints. Uh, I've had numerous encounters with the LA County Sheriff's Department. Not one has been calling me a healthy. Uh, at the age of 19, I was stopped every day. I was beaten up most days. I was pushed to the ground most days. My car 
was always investigated to see if I was carrying something. But I was never treated in a kind way. I am not convinced that 19-year-old black men in L.A. County are treated any better by the L.A. County Sheriff's Department today. Mm -hmm. I'd like to believe that maybe there have been some changes. But uh, I know my experience as a student by the president, as the editor of the high school newspaper, as the captain of the big team, who had not committed a crime, experienced something other than uh, casual, supportive contact with the other county sheriff's department. I say that because when people come before this body, there's an expectation that the outcome will be closer to being in their favor. But if you do not have subpoena power, you cannot call into accountability the persons whose uh, conduct has come to your attention. So I, I would like you to help me to understand what we can do to help you have the power that you need to bring people before you with the authority to take action. And then finally, uh, with subpoena power, do you have the power to discipline uh, persons who violate uh, this ability in this case? So subpoena power and disciplinary power uh, are, the, uh, are the items that I think this body should be endowed with if you were to go forward. Thank you. speaking on behalf of the immigrant community here. Um, one of the predominant concerns that I've come across in the immigrant community is up there is a lot of fear. And a lot of that is based on what they've been seeing between department, the department or local law enforcement, not just the department itself, and also the federal immigration authorities, particularly CBP and Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, and so not too long ago there was a joint there was a joint operation with the CMI between the Sheriff's Department and Customs Border Operation, uh, Border Patrol. And so they went down and took somebody, a uh, girl, she was a dreamer. She was here, she was not talking to me, she was an activist. And so what our community believes is that immigration is out being retaliatory towards her for being here, for speaking out. And so the sheriffs are collaborating, that's what the community sees. So we think that the sheriffs are also collaborating and being retaliatory as well. And so when there's, the public has this perception that the sheriffs and nobody's getting involved, but when they see it, how do I address that concern? You know, that's a tough one because what they're seeing is not what's being said. And so when people get ripped from their families, that's very tough. And I don't know how to address that because the answer is not there. It's because what they're saying and what they see is totally different. And I see the same thing. And so that's one of the issues that I want to bring to you today. And that's a very thing because LA County has a very, very large immigrant community. And so there is just so much widespread fear. And people are just scared, you know. Sometimes they see cones and stuff, they think that the sheriff's out there to take mm -hmm. them and get a deport them. Because that's how bad it is, because that's what they're seeing. Um, but some other issues that are coming to us, to the coalition, from the, from the general public, are issues with policy, with transparency, how do they get the complaints heard, and how do they know that they're being heard, and how, they, how they're actually being addressed. Um, other policies that the public that's bringing to us is that they feel that there is you know, an understanding between the district attorney's office and the sheriff's in, in the case of a use of force, whatever, that the law enforcement agency would do their best case first, but the DA step in, and they feel that that's wrong. They would rather have the DA come step in first, or some other outside agency, maybe a special prosecutor, whatever the case may be, whatever solutions may come around, because that's not the only solution. Um, and another policy that's being brought up is that when people graduate from the academy, they always go to the jails first, and then they come to the streets. Mm -hmm. People are asking to have that, mm -hmm. have that re-looked at. Mm -hmm. You know, and have people just go from the academy to the streets, just like with LAPD and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so those are the few issues that I just wanted to hear today. So thank you for coming out. Wow.
conditions and so on, like, uh, for example, the, the situation in Englewood uh, around the, the deaths of uh, Mark Quinton Sandlin and Keisha Michaels, uh, where the, the uh, city council is stonewalling and not releasing information and how that results in a lack of transparency and how the community is feeling about the fact that they're not able to get any information in regard to what happened to those people when they were sleeping in a car and were killed. Mm -hmm. um, just wanted to know that you know, you're paying attention to stuff like that and that, that their police commission has been like marginalized or disbanded. They don't even exist. I don't know what the heck is going on. Um, um, <coughs> Also wanted to, you know, again, this on this transparency thing, just revisit this idea about the 300 problematic uh, officers that are happening within the uh, sheriff's department. You know, kind of, you know, just want to underscore that you know, we should be paying attention to that. Maybe there should be uh, some, I don't know, I don't know, some oversight on that. That's all. We, that's all we want, right? Some civilian oversight. Right? Um, Training, uh, on training, because that's, that's an area of uh, my specialty, um, I wanted to admonish you to pay close attention to the training that the sheriff's deputies receive. Um, two things in particular, unconscious bias training, it's very important stuff, right? Um, De-escalation training, very important stuff. But I need you to understand that these are perishable skills. It's not something that you can go into training for in a four-hour block and then check the box and it's been done. These are things that need to be put into practice and that um, they need to be revisited on a consistent basis in terms of training. Right? I, just, you know, I would love to have an opportunity to sit in on some of those trainings that are happening so I can more accurately understand what's going on in those trainings and perhaps I can offer some uh, suggestion uh, or recommendation on that. I'll leave that to you guys. That's, that's, your, that's I guess, your job. Um, the third thing that I had concerns about was what this gentleman just uh, reminded us about. Um, I want you to be vigilant about um, how much, if at all, the sheriff's department is cooperating with ICE. Right? I mean, obviously, we, we, we are what we call a sanctuary city. Um, public officials at the top all declared that we're a sanctuary city and that we're not cooperating. Well, you know, to me, not cooperating is getting in the way. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how us activists do it. We get in the way when we're not cooperating. And just, you know, I know it makes everybody uncomfortable when we get in the way, but that's what we do. That's our job, right? Um, that's what George Soros uh, pays me to do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Is he funny or what? The people that I serve um, in my community, the young people that I work with, uh, their families are terrorized. And they don't know the difference between Hi. one police or another police. It says police on the back. They don't know. So, y'all, y'all, really, be vigilant. Thank you. Wow. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, I first want to uh, acknowledge what everybody in this room understands, which is the uh, centrality of your role, your leadership role in this uh, county, a single county that uh, holds more people than 44 of the 50 states in it. So that what you do and what we do in the community matters significantly in our national life. What you're doing now seems to me very central to this county's overall effort uh, toward diversion and support for reentry services. It even bears on the question of whether there should be uh, new jail construction in the county. So the implications are enormous for us and for the country as a whole. I want to raise the question of what it means to be deep listeners in a community that has been as traumatized as this one has been for so long under the regime of the county sheriff department. That's a real question, that's not a rhetorical question. What does it mean to listen, not just in sessions like this, but really to be led by the community toward a different future for the county, a very different future than the one we've had. I accept that the, that the commission begins with all the disabilities that have been described this morning in terms of structure and, and even personnel. 
That doesn't mean you can't function as an organizing entity, which I think you must, building on the work of Dignity and Power Now and others, to change the conversation dramatically, not superficially. I sound like a preacher, I, I apologize for that. Uh, my experience of the uh, deputies is very different from my colleague, uh, when I moved here from New York, I the western part of Altadena. As a white man, the officer said to me, how can I help you, sir? Mm -hmm. Not to my neighbors, people of color. I saw what the, what the deputies did up there, and I'm like, wow, that would not happen in Beverly Hills. More recently, a uh, young person I know, African-American guy, suffered uh, sexual assault and asked me to accompany him to the deputy station in West Hollywood, where he was treated more than shallowly. He was treated contemptuously by the officers there, who tried to probe his sexual proclivities and make him somehow responsible for his rape. Let's call it what it was. Right? Mm. His frustration, the fact that there's no resolution, no investigation, no detective, he was only treated respectfully when a senior African-American officer came into that scene and recognized he needed to get medical help for one thing. Mm. Um, enough. You labor under the weight of a tremendous history. And it's deeper than even the personal histories that have been shared with you. It's the history of the fact that the Sheriff's Department in Southern California emerges from the pattern of Southern Sheriff's Departments. Mm -hmm. Other speakers mm -hmm. have spoken to that. So that's the weight, the burden of history that you wrestle with. I will do what I can. I had some health problems, so I dropped out of this progress for a while, but I'll be back. I will do whatever I can personally and uh, through my organization to uh, support that work. Thank you. Wow. Sheriff Baca, as close as I have, very close personally, sat with him at the last four California dinner with the legislators and the chiefs of staff for an hour. They listened to us talk about what we were doing. Anybody who knows of anything about the Sheriff Department and the legislation knows who I am and poor California is. He thought with the death of Kemp slash King the Fourth that it was over. Wrong. <coughs> We were the only honest civil rights group around. We didn't take anybody's outside money, and now I know how many people hated him because of the hell I've been in since he died. Falsely charged with crimes. Prevented by LAPD and the Sheriff's Department from my phone call for three to five days. Almost killed in your jail the last time, multiple times, two days after ICU with a judge. Won't look at any letters from doctors when they spent $40,000 on me in two days, spent $2,000 an hour for a person sitting next to me, hooked up to, I, to monitors with them going off constantly, and then I'm thrown in your filthy jail where you have no food for diabetics, you're killing them in there. <coughs> and as a psych ward, you threw a civil rights leader twice in the medical psych ward. So they can talk to me. I'm the only person they ever trusted. You want to know what goes on in your filthy pig jail? Talk to me. You talk to inmates. You don't talk to anybody else. I've listened to a lot of good people here. This reminds me of the old citizens advisory board. Where we had three under sheriffs there all the time listening to people. I'm videoing this right now. I was the only person that videoed them, loaded them to YouTube like I am this one, like I did the meeting here last week, where the ACLU lied to everybody about bail bonds and kicked me out. It's all loaded on YouTube, as is Chief Beck of the LAPD committing felonies with the police commission when they erased the audio to the 5515 meeting, which since they loaded on the web, is serious federal crimes and twice published nationally. It has been said that I called Chief Beth a bigot, which everybody knows is a call for police to hit me for two years. This was sent to inmates recently in the Twin Towers. 
This is seven weeks later. I just got it back. I spent fifty dollars to communicate with those inmates who saved my life in there while I was dying as a white guy I would. While I help guys with murder cases. I listen to your psychiatrist tell inmates it's okay if you don't go to sleep for a month or two. You get used to it. We were putting arts back into the jails. I have the contacts for you. Do you want to stop the violence in the medical psych ward? You have gone from 60 to 68 beds. You have taken out 25 stools and table people. We're going to have riots in there. You are medicating people so heavy they go to sleep after lunch. Do you know how many people are being falsely prosecuted by the DA right now for misdemeanors illegal since 1915? And I'm threatened by judges in court right now because I bring up the criminality of the LADA Jackie Lacey. She's going to jail. She's back to jail. They're on Baca right now to protect Chief Beck. I can prove it. I admire what you're doing here. And good people, thank you for coming. I've missed this for three years since they killed the CAB. Thank you, sheriffs, for being here. I worked for years to help you stop this. The inmates two times in the last three years have begged me to come here and help stop this. Please, listen to the good people here who know. You know, don't you? I'm a wood. They protected me, didn't kill me in there. Linda Eaton, followed by Donald Lovitz, Richard Bernard, and Mark F. Lee Good morning. My name is Reverend Linda Eaton. I'm Member well, you're wrong, man. AME. And I just thank you all for being here and I always pray for our I am. law I put my life on all that. I know you're out there on the streets and there's good and bad everywhere. And I thank God that the good outweigh the bad. And what my uh, I represent Normandy Halldale Block Club. And what my concern is everything has been said so far. I'm sure everyone concur with everything that's been said that's happening around in Los Angeles and other areas. But my concern is the fireworks that we have. Uh, we have a holiday coming up. But in my area, people are already firing off illegal fireworks. And I see a little bit of advertising about what will happen uh, if they're caught. I don't see a lot, and I do remember last year in my area I had to call because some of the Normandy Block Club members did call me and ask me about it, and I told them why don't they call? You know, we all should call. Don't just call me to call. And of course we're concerned about if they're going to tell who called because they're in retaliation. But in my area, just every other night, if not every night, we hear these big old things going off like it's a little uh, a rocket and my dog started barking. My dog has a little area where he sleeps in but he wants to come in and get in the bed with me and my husband because he's so scared. But these things, uh, cars are going off the alarm and if this is happening you know they're illegal. So what I want to know is what are you going to do about it this year because every year someone gets killed someone get hurt, um, something happens that's really horrible to the, to the people in the neighborhood. So I want to know what can be done about it. I don't want to be told that, oh, we can't catch everybody, but if I'm calling you, I'm telling you where you can go and catch somebody. And I'm sure maybe you get other calls, but uh, there have been times where the police have come out and they've gone and it stopped it. But uh, to start in May, that's scary. What are they going to do when July 4th come? So I just want to know if those issues of stress and what are the penalties are. Uh, they're not really saying a whole lot about that. 
But, and I don't understand how they're able to breed. Well, I guess I should understand it because they have illegal, illegal drugs, illegal rifles, and nobody's stopping that. But we do need more uh, uh, eyes and uh, more uh, uh, better laws on these things when these people are bringing in these illegal fireworks. And uh, it doesn't matter to them until somebody in their family get hurt. So those are my concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, first, you should know that we can fill this church with a lot of angry, angry people. I mean, you voices couldn't be heard. You couldn't put enough cops out here to keep them from getting angrier for what they're feeling. Second, well, we can fill this church with a bunch of people who love this city and believe in what you guys think. You got a tough job. I'm going to do it. You got a tough job. I can do this job because it's got to be done. All right. Um, secondly, this is my community. This is my church. I want you to feel like this is your community and your church. How would you act? How would you act? What are you going to do when this is your church and your community and people are dying? That's what you got to start thinking about. Next, you got to be a deep listener. I mean, that is so important. And what I'd like to see is you take one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and every week you get out to the communities. You go someplace and you listen to what somebody has to say. You ride along with some of their best officers. Find out what's really going on out there. Then you'll be able to say, oh, we have to shuffle this deck a little bit differently. Sometimes small changes make big differences. That's what you can start off doing. And then third again, um, this is a tough job. But do your job, man. Do your job. Do it. Thank you, sir. Wow. Uh, Pastor Q. Jean Marie, and then uh, Jesse Weston. Good morning. My name is Tanisha Marie, Jesse Coalition. Um, I just want to welcome more conversation, um, more action, more resolution. Um, so the YAC has been um, in talking to the Sheriff's Department and we also want to make contact with the Inspector General's Office um, to push for a family platform for victims of families so that we're protecting our victims and their families and also holding, and they're also involved with holding um, law enforcement accountable with some real results. And we also want to um, push more on a new complaint process for the Sheriff's Department. Um, as far as the weekly collection of complaints from the county jails and the courts, we want to have quarterly meetings that people are involved in and have real solutions and have um, third parties out of reviewing these, these, um, these uh, reports and stuff like that, these complaints, because if it's, you know, it's one body complaining against each other, who's going to really tell them they're friends? So we really need to have third bodies that are really investigating these complaints because they're happening every day and the conversation that we're having today just can't stop today because. You know, we have to have action and they're still victims and many families out here that are waiting for more answers. And the, the compensation that you're giving families is not enough for the, the, the nights and stuff we have to go without their families. The days that they go thinking, looking at the next law enforcement officer, and they still don't have many answers to, you know, what happened to their, their victim or them. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, we are happy to see you again. Uh, Mark Anthony Johnson, Dignity and Power Now, also with the Coalition of Shared Violence. Um, really encouraged to see that we're having meetings and town halls in the community. Um, this is a project that we've been up to, as many folks in this room have been up to for five years, and it's exciting that we're actually here um, at this point. Uh, so just wanted to comment, I know one of the topics was around body cameras, and we at the Coalition of Shared Violence was an uh, organ. Uh, Coalition of over 30 organizations over the years uh, to the sheriffs having body cameras. Part of that is because there's no conclusive evidence that body cameras are actually effective. There's a study that came out last May from the Bureau of Justice Assistance that found that from a randomized assessment of 10 uh, law enforcement agencies that there was actually no impact on use of force. In fact, in some jurisdictions there was an increase in uptake in use of force due to body cameras. 
And another report that was reported on in May, I'm sorry, in November, found an 18% increase in use of force in law enforcement uh, jurisdictions that use body cameras. Uh, so we actually do not believe that there is any evidence uh, to invest millions of dollars uh, in the use of body cameras. We also don't want to increase any surveillance on our communities because how often it happens is that body cameras are directed at us, the footage is on us. Uh, we also have a history of, of a sheriff's department that has a history of um, tampering with evidence, uh, avoiding cameras in the jails. And so we have no reason to trust uh, that this footage will be of any use to us, nor will we have access to it. The other piece I want to say is that we're talking about conditions in the jail. Last week we were working with a mother whose daughter was told she had attempted suicide. Uh, and her, her daughter was given a medication uh, that she had some adverse reactions to. Uh, her daughter did not want to make a request for a change in medication because she was afraid of retaliation. That's the quality of care that is happening mm -hmm. currently in the jail. So it's not care, mm -hmm. it's in fact amounts to human rights violations over mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. And I just want to echo um, the call for power, uh, real power, including subpoena power. When this commission was being generated, before it actually started, there were town hall meetings across one in each district with rooms like this filled with people and the overwhelming majority of folks said this commission needs power, at minimum subpoena. Power. There was a, a mention of disciplinary power, which we agree with, and that is the only way we're going to get uh, to real solutions that our folks need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow. Director Williams, Director, will we be able to engage and ask questions? Should we refrain now, abstain now, or should we do it as they are coming forward? It's up to you. We can do it now. Just before Pastor, you come. Mark Anthony, you can come back to the mic. Uh, Chair uh, Bonner has a question for you. I know that you and your big and uh, Howard Al and others have thought it's very important that this commission have some people. And uh, so far, uh, I don't think there's been any situation where we wanted somebody to come before the commission that has refused to do that with the client. Could happen in the future. Uh, so far, as I know, our executive director can speak to this. All our requests for information, at least to the sheriff's department, have been honored. Uh, but my question is, uh, what if the commission has subpoena power? What would we be? What would we use it for? How do you how do you envision that this commission would use subpoena power? So one of the reasons we say that this commission needs to be around, one of the, oftentimes what it's talked about is around getting documentation, right? And then the counter argument to that, well, the police officer bill of rights would actually block that. One of the things that we see that could concretely help is actually calling in folks who are actively involved in jail conditions. So for example, people involved in care and getting testimony from those people around what are the things that are happening. That, yeah. that level mm -hmm. of testimony from people who are involved, third parties who are involved in the care of our folks inside the county jail system could actually save lives. And we've seen this over and over with folks who are in there right now who we've talked to who say, hey, if this commission lie. subpoenaed me, I would give you so much documentation on the failure of human rights. I mean, I'm sorry, the failure of medical care that is amounting to human rights violations over and over and over, day in, day out. Um, and the continued violations of the DOJ um, uh, mandates that this department has. So that's one concrete way in which we see that subpoena power can not only be useful, but can actually save lives. And, and this would be, just so I, uh, so I can uh, conceptualize this, this would be not necessarily inmate who would presumably come voluntarily before this commission, uh, at least some might. There might be some reasons why they wouldn't be there. I understand that. Even after I got some that would. But this is people that work in the jail, other than the deputies and the custody assistants, mm -hmm. like mental health, like mental health, health, anyone from the Department of Health Services, those types of things. Got it. Thank you. Mm hmm. Good morning, Commissioners. I'd like to echo everything Mark Henry said. <laughs> We have been putting together commissions, law enforcement commission, by the way, since 1871. But the broken system still has not been fixed. I keep hearing there is a few bad apples. And as a pastor of the church, 
without walls and skid row and black and brown clergy coalition and black Jewish and part of the black Jewish justice alliance. The scripture says a little leaven mm. leavens mm. the whole lump. Mm. Yes, sir. So if there's no accountability, if there's no subpoena power, if there's no ability for the commission to discipline folks, the level continues to permeate the law, as we can see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The system is broken. Are we going to have to wait until what happened in Oakland and how we accountable? just recently, where the city passed a commission by 82% of the vote, by the way, with subpoena power and with the ability for the commission to discipline the police department. Having mm. last November. I think the way we look at our criminal justice system is a problem. Why is it called a criminal justice system and not just a justice system? Because <laughs> our focus on criminality skewing our vision of reimagining public safety. How can we fix a system that puts more justice in criminality than on just or more focus on criminality than on justice? Speaking of women, black women dying in custody. Lakeisha Wilson mm. died in police custody. And we have to rely on what they say. As a community, we have to rely on a police department that we do not trust. And we have to take their word for it. Mm -hmm. This is why it's important to have accountability. Because if you have accountability, then we can trust you. Because there is accountability. As a pastor, I know that. As a leader in the church, I can do whatever I want and not have accountability. That's why we have boards and we have accountability system. And we have many boards that hold us accountable. Trauma upon trauma. When we see Waukesha Wilson and we see the young lady that was just spoken about, all of these things we don't separate. We don't go to the sheriff's department. LAPD. We don't do that. It's just trauma upon trauma upon trauma mm. upon trauma. And those traumas, it does two things, or three things. First, hopelessness, anger and bitterness, and distrust. This is why people keep coming up here and saying, we want to be a power. Because for us, it's more than just what it does, it's also symbolic to let us know that there is power. Mm -hmm. Again, we had the Kerner Commission in 1967 after we had 163 riots mm -hmm. in black communities across the nation. 163 riots and the Kerner Commission came back. And they said the problems <coughs> were always focused on training and more sophisticated weaponry. Mm. Training and more sophisticated yeah. weaponry. More sophisticated tools. Oh, Body yeah. cameras. We have, we have cameras for Waukesha Wilson. But 21 minutes of the footage was missing. <coughs> we had so many folks who were seen on camera. And the police were not indicted. No charges filed. Uh, I'm sure people can call them out. Body, we could put more money into solving crime. And when I say, I, I, I really what I want to say, put more resources into preventing crime than putting all our resources into predicting crime. And we know that crime prevention deals with education, more jobs, and dealing with the issues that really cause us to cry. Thank you. Thank wow. You.
John Page. Jesse Wexler, and I'm an individual, an activist, and I'm here representing uh, People Power with the ACLU. And uh, I'd just first like to mention that when I came in here, when I first uh, came in uh, with a friend of mine driving in, I was here for the commission. I was a little bit uh, uncomfortable uh, driving in with uh, two uh, uh, sheriff's cars. And so the sheriff's standing here, please. first of all, people, uh, this might be a safety issue, I'm not sure, but just for me personally, uh, I'm uncomfortable just having uh, sheriffs around. I don't know about other people and how they're feeling. Uh, what I'm here for is uh, concern about uh, SB 54 and ICE and CDP uh, rates here. I'd like to hear from the Commission. That's uh, really why I'm here, uh, to connect with the Commission and to hear how we are going to be addressing the issues. I don't uh, think that it needs to be specifics about what it is. I think you know what it is. So how do we connect and know what it is that's going to be taking place and what we can actually do to speak with. And basically that, just what are we going to do, how we are going to address it, and what can we do to change it. Thank you. So I'll be followed by Pastor Kate. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming here and doing this. Thank you for having me, giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm AJ Ali. I'm a U.S. Air Force veteran. Been married for 23 years. I'm a grandfather. And uh, my mission is to make this this country and my community I live in Santa Monica a safer place for all of us. One that uh, puts love first. And uh, back in 2012, I was. Uh, racially profiled in Howard County, Maryland. I was walking in a neighborhood where the police told me that I, sh I shouldn't have been because they were stopping everyone who looked like they didn't live in that neighborhood. I reported what happened that day with those three officers, with the threats that were made, uh, with all of the uh, prompting for me to do something wrong so that they could take me down or put me under arrest. I reported everything to the Internal Affairs Department, to the NAACP, to the Human Rights Commission, and I was rewarded with a letter that said, we'll take it from here, it's a training matter, and I was also rewarded with a year of harassment by officers of that police department, <laughs> because I had the audacity to report something that had happened that was wrong. I didn't realize until six or seven months later that uh, when, a, when a young female officer came into a Starbucks and told me, I know you. And I said, I'm sorry, but I don't recognize you. And she said, I'm a Howard County police officer. And your name, your, your likeness, your information has been spread throughout the department. <laughs> so I didn't realize that I had been targeted to that extent. But she also told me at that time, after you get done with what you're working on, with the film that you're making about policing, would you please do one on sexual harassment within the police department mm. as well? <laughs> now, I didn't take that issue on, but I did complete a film called Walking While Black, Love is the Answer. Mm. And that came out February 1st, and it's, it's available to see, and I also encourage you to put the principles of love into action in your work. Love is an acronym for learn about the community in which you serve, open your heart to the people and their needs, Volunteer yourself to be part of the solution and empower others to do the same. And, you know, I think I can speak for everyone in this room when I say all we want is love. All we want is for protection. All we want is support. All we want is for you to do your job as you swore to protect and serve the community. I did a ride along with uh, Officer Jacob Holloway of the Santa Monica Police Department a couple days ago. I encourage everyone in here to do a ride along with an officer in your community. We came upon a man lying in the street, and he was sleeping. And this officer, I was in the passenger seat, he, he drove up, and the first words out of his mouth after 
we woke the gentleman up. And I, we, neither of us knew whether he was dead or alive or sleeping or what. We didn't know how he was going to react when he woke up. Uh, Jacob told me that many times when they approach someone like that, it's it's a it's a dicey situation because you don't know how that person's going to react. First words out of his mouth to that gentleman after after he woke up, Jacob said to the man, "Is there anything I can do to help you?" Mm. That was compassion. And it wasn't just that one time. I was with him for four and a half hours, and I saw him do things time and time again, acts of compassion, protecting and serving. He did things that that made me proud to be a Santa Monica resident. So I, I, I ask you, please, as you do your job, smile, say hello. You know, when I, when I came in here, I, I echo the sentiments of the last gentleman. I, I came in and saw the cars, and I saw the officers outside, and not one greeting, not one smile, not one look of acknowledgement that yeah. we're in this together. That's all we want. That's all we want. We applaud you. I, I, I wore the uniform as a U.S. Air Force veteran. I respect the uniform. We want the same respect coming back to us. Wow. Since we're in the house of the Lord, I just want to close with something. And this will take a second. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Reverend John Cager. I'm the pastor here. I'm also the president of the Los Angeles Council of Religious Leaders, which represents some 20 adjudicatories in LA County and uh, beyond. And my uh, comments today regard uh, your oversight of the training and the culture of the Sheriff's Department. Uh, former Sheriff Lee Baca is a convicted felon. Under Sheriff uh, Horn, Sheriff Falkenock is convicted felon. A former sheriff of Orange County, Mike Corona, is convicted felon. And they're all felons mostly because they operated under an old cultural understanding. All of them did things that the Peter Pitchesses and the Sherman Blocks and people going back into uh, the Sheriff's Department uh, lore did. You know, you, you nudge a witness here, you hide a piece of paper there, you move some people around. Say it, sir. But because mm -hmm. culture, and, and technology has played a part of this, because culture has changed, they got caught up and they now got federal tags on them for the rest of their lives. We know that for many of you who are in the command structure, you're going to be gone. You're going to sit down in three, four, five years. You won't have to worry about the wave of change that is coming around the country, but even with Sessions as Attorney General, the arc is bending towards a different culture in law enforcement, and it is my hope that you all are paying attention to how the new uh, deputies are being trained as they come in, how they're being mentored by older officers, because even if policy changes are made, mm -hmm. if the culture is not changed, yes, even yes, though you have things on paper, those who are training them in the jails, those who are riding with them in the cars, are going to teach them the methods of Peter Pitches and Sherman Bach and yep. Lee Baca. So and what will happen is that that old culture will prevail and we won't get the changes that we need. Secondly, uh, and we have uh, 29 enemy churches in L.A. County. 20 of them are in areas that are under the jurisdiction of the L.A. Sheriff's Department. We would love if the Sheriff's Department would do like LAPD is doing now and come in and establish relationships with our churches. We, we
we, we, we love law enforcement in South LA. That's why, that's why we call you all the time. Our kids act up, we don't call you. Our husband messed up, we don't call them. You know, we, we love having, you know, calling you, but if we have a relationship with you, that's the easiest way to change the culture. And I know you all do that because I go up to, you know, the West Valley and out there and the sheriffs are all coming to church and they're, you know, going to the picnics and doing all this kind of stuff. You have that stuff in, in, in South LA too. You cannot come in this part of the county with an idea of, okay, we're strapped up for war. And then you're in another part of the county where you're like, oh, we're home. So we want you all as a commission to not just focus on the, the message, but focus on the culture and the training. Thank you. Please do. Quite our discrimination, huh? <laughs> Cheers. Hello. Uh, my name is Milena Jankovic. Um, I represent a group of about 40 people on the west side of LA, Venice, uh, Marina del Rey, uh, Playa del Rey, and Mar Vista areas. Our group came together recently, just a couple of months ago, and it, it was in reaction to a surge of deportations, not in our community, but in other communities in Los Angeles, mostly communities that are not as affluent as ours. The group of people that I represent stands in support of SB 54. We demand more transparency and we demand a disentanglement of immigration and criminal law. Yeah. We know that the sheriff's in opposition of this proposed legislation and we understand why, but we reject that explanation. On a personal note, if I can say something, uh, I went to a dyke march last night in West Hollywood. <laughs> LASD provided security for that event, and I was very thankful for the officer, for the officers being there. I felt secure. It's a, it's a change. You used to beat us, and now you're there to protect us, and I'm very thankful for that. But listening to the people here today, I'm realizing the courtesy that was extended to me is not extended to everybody. It's 2017, and the courtesy seems to really not be extended to the people of color and to the immigrant community. And that is not right. We are awake, we are organized, and we are calling our elected officials every day. It's not right. You are here to listen, and it's really important and it's wonderful to see. I'm uh, very, again, we're very thankful for that. But you also have to accept you have to stop telling us that it's only a couple of bad apples. You have to accept that there are things wrong with your department. That's right. Sure. That's where you begin to get better. That's where the healing starts. That's, That's right. where the relationship with the community is going to start getting better. Thank you very much. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give everyone a hand. Let's substantive um, meeting town hall in my estimation today um, and as we come to a close and soon to divorce ourselves from this place one thing that I'm heartened by when I um, listen attentively to all of the speakers come to the microphone I looked at the landscape of the uh, platform and noticed that um, everybody on the platform from our executive director to our commissioners and even our deputies were taking uh, notes, uh, writing down, uh, jotting down, even though I don't know which each one uh, jotted down, the fact that uh, the commissioners and even our deputies were engaged, I think that is a very uh, heartening and encouraging moment uh, for all who are present in the room today. Um, uh, before we leave today and adjourn and give the benediction, or the adjournment rather, uh, dismissal, I want to ask um, any of our commissioners, starting with Commissioner Harris, if he would like to uh, have any um, comments uh, or any questions of uh, those who have come to the night today. Commissioner Harris. Yeah, I, I just uh, do want to thank everyone for coming here today. I know a lot of things that are being said are difficult to say, perhaps in this form, I think they are heartfelt. I want you to know that uh, 
the commissioners do hear what you're saying, and we are really taking to heart all the things that you are bringing forward from your hearts. We know there's a lot of hurt in the community, and as we are uh, we're going to do everything in our power to try and provide uh, appropriate oversight to the sheriffs, and hopefully uh, there will be some positive changes that you will all recognize. We know that change does not happen overnight. I know a lot of things that are being brought forward here, these meetings are things that have happened um, a long time in the past, but that doesn't mean that things are suddenly all better now. And we know that, and we will continue to uh, do what we can to provide the necessary oversight to make meaningful change so that uh, the entire community will feel more that we are all working together. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Commissioner Olson. Uh, thank you. Um, so I just really again want to express my appreciation for all of you um, taking the time to express your concerns, to share with us what you think the commission's priorities should be. Um, you know, uh, uh, Pastor Thompson talked a bit about some of the, the things that are currently on our plate, and we hope to be able to you know, come back in a couple months or even sooner to address you and talk about what we've been able to do. And we also hope to hear from you about what we need to be doing better. Um, you know, we're not experts. I'm not an expert. I may be a professor, but uh, and contrary to what a lot of folks think, I don't think I know everything. Um, we're representatives, and we hope to be able to partner with you to, uh, to exchange information, to, to strategize, to think about how we can build better uh, communities. Um, we hope that you will push us and demand the best of us. Um, and, you know, uh, my information is on the commission website. Um, I'm available by phone and email. I appreciate those of you who've been emailing about the, the issues related to drones. I hope that you'll continue to communicate with us about what your concerns are. Um, if you would like to talk, I'm happy to, to do that. Um, I'm more, uh, literally, or figuratively, is always um, open. Uh, this is a big project. And again, I hope that you will uh, pardon us. All of you who spoke, I hope that you signed in, that, that we keep in touch and that we can uh, continue to build better communities. Mr. Chair? Well, I, I echo the comment of my comments of my fellow commissioners, uh, and particularly thanking all of you who have attended and all of you that have not only attended but have. Us your comments, your thoughts. Uh, I just want to say I think the, the comments and thoughts that we've heard from the community here at this town hall are extremely valuable to all of us as commissioners. Um, in fact, I was taken by uh, you know one comment that uh, I've, I've, I've written down many of them. That one was that literally could be the motto of uh, or the mission of the Civil Oversight Commission, and that is building trust through reform. So I think that's what we're all about. And hopefully, uh, in the fullness of time, we'll see that this is a serious, meaningful operation and that it does uh, uh, facilitate important reforms that need to be made to uh, essentially build trust between the community and the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. So thank you for being here. you for your leadership and your uh, guiding us on this commission. I think the buzzword, the takeaway, and I want to get to the, our um, tiers of leadership of the County Sheriff's Department who was present today, and uh, just let me go and do that right now, and I'll save my comments uh, for later. Um, uh, let's first of all, let's clap our hands for them. We will uh, ask if you all have any comment. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson. Uh, again, I want to also uh, give you my appreciation for being able to speak to it. I know it's difficult for some people to come in here and look us in the eye and criticize uh, or uh, express uh, the plenary issues that you have with our department. I can tell you we're here uh, to listen, we're here to take back, and we're taking notes, we're documenting the issues that are being shared with us. And uh, many of the issues we're very familiar with, uh, many of the incidents that were shared with us are things that I'm very well uh, uh, 
informed on. Uh, I just want to just let you know that, uh, again, for those that express concerns about the deputy's presence here, that they're here for to protect all of you. Uh, we're here uh, to protect the process that's going on here. Uh, there's no enforcement action going on here. Uh, I've heard that concern before, so I just wanted to talk about that. There's many, many significant events going on today that we have our personnel involved in, the Special Olympics uh, down in Long Beach, where we have a lot of our personnel there. The sheriff is there. Uh, we're here. We have our chiefs here from the patrol and custody division that hear concerns that are shared about our patrol operations as well as conditions in the jails. Uh, we have representatives here uh, from medical services and, and mental health side to, to take all this in mm. so and take it back and discuss and see what issues uh, that we still need to continue to work on. So again, I appreciate the, the fact that you would come out here. Uh, I appreciate the comments of the experiences in West Hollywood. Uh, we have a lot of personnel there over the weekend, a lot of people coming out to enjoy, and we want to make sure it's a safe uh, environment for all in these troubling times of what you see going on around the world, basically. And I just wanted to share all that. Uh, I know we're going to be talking about uh, our managerial systems, uh, the fact that how we use them, the policies we have to regulate how those are used, the fact that it's probably going to be used today. We have over 200 personnel up in Santa Barbara County searching for the five-year-old that's been uh, missing for uh, going on two months now. Uh, that's the type of thing that we're doing. So again, I don't say all that stuff to minimize anybody's personal interaction that they've expressed here today. We know that uh, there will be things that don't go the way they should, and that's why we do hold <coughs> people accountable inside. But I want to give you that commitment that we have processes, we work well with the Commission as well as the OIG because we want to be the best that we can be. We want to be the best law enforcement organization in the nation. And, uh, you know, we, we hire from the human race, we know that no one is perfect, and we know that there will be issues. We deal with some very challenging interactions at times, and uh, sometimes there's mistakes. We want to hear about them. We want to correct them. That is a commitment from Sheriff Jim McDonald, and all of us here share that same commitment. So thank you again for uh, coming out and uh, expressing yourselves to us. Thank you. I'm sure he speaks for all of the uh, tiers of leadership who was present today. Um, Lord Wilkie, are you still here? Lord, I just had a question as it relates to unconscious body training and de-escalation. What did you mean by that? Unconscious body training. Unconscious bias training. Okay, I thought you said body training. I'm sorry. That's what I was listening to. All right. Unconscious bias training. All right. And de-escalation. Right. I got that now. I got that now. Did I see a hand in the back? Gentlemen on the commission, I'm curious, man, you said you don't have any experts on the board. Why in the heck do you not have any experts on the board? I didn't say that. But well, who's the I expert? No, no, no. I, I said that I don't know everything. And that's why we need to partner with the community. Because there are experts in this room. There are people that are on the board. You're going to tell me you ask me a question. You ask me a question. There are people in this room that are experts on their experience with the Sheriff's Department and the structural inequalities in the system. There are people who have been incarcerated. There are people who are scholars who study how policing is functioning across this country. And I would presume to know better than that. Yeah, I'm one, of, I'm so one of those scholars. Question, I'm just answering your question. So what I'm suggesting <laughs> is that we're partners. And I bring what I know. She's been. And I partner and collaborate and combine that with what folks know in the community. I appreciate your question and the opportunity to clarify. Okay, ma'am. Who on this board, what experts have you consulted with to do these things, I, I don't, it's not a disrespect for the community. The community is an expert in the output of policing. You need experts for the input of policing. When who is controlling the system, you can't ask the factory worker what the CEO is doing. So what are you guys doing to consult experts? Name one expert, one of these scholars that you've talked to for the, the pressing issue of the, the cutting edge of science. You're looking at me weird, but I'm one of these scholars. So if you knew this and you were studying the topic, you would all know who I am. All right. So to each of you who are present. Michael no, no, Wood no, no, Jr., Google is right now. Listen, You'll brother, be saying, I'm going to catch you. Listen, brother, listen, 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 listen. We, we, we've done great, and we're not going to end on a bad note. Uh, what we seek to do Come on. is to be part of It's not a bad note. I am a scholar and an expert, and you're saying I'm a bad note. Listen to me. 
They're spinning. And what we seek to do, and thank you so much, Pastor. And what we seek to do is to solicit your patience and your partnership with us. And this is why we're here, and this is why we are seeking to have these town hall meetings is to give you an opportunity to vent and to voice your ideas, your concerns, your recommendations. We are solicitous of that and we're asking each of you to be patient as this process unfold. Having said that, I want to thank each of you for divorcing yourself from your busy schedules on Saturdays on this Saturday rather, and coming to let your voice uh, be heard. We promise you as commissioners that we hear you, we have documented your concerns, give us an opportunity to partner with you who are the stakeholders uh, being the community. Thank you for that. I want to close by saying to our executive director, thank you sir uh, for all that you're doing with your staff and working in concert with the uh, commission, uh, oversight commission. Thank you so much. Having said that, this meeting is adjourned and we look forward to the next meeting. You are dismissed. <laughs> wow.